So there you are. And you know, we actually have somebody here today who had a birthday yesterday on St. Patrick's Day. Cassandra had her birthday on Patrick's Day. I don't know too many people who have their birthdays on St. Patrick's Day. So I said to her, you could have ended up as Patricia if you were dropped in another country. <laughs> but thankfully, she's Cassandra. <laughs> so many happy returns of the day, my dear. It's good to honor people when we know about their birthdays. And so here we are in this blessed day, and what we're looking at is just one thing. We just get to focus on one thing today. Isn't that a beautiful thing, an amazing thing? Just one thing, one thing at a time, singular focus. And the one thing we're looking at is life, life itself, with capitals, L-I-F-E, life. So you hear it said many times in these establishments of uh, Centers for Spiritual Living, there's only one life, there's only one power, there's only one presence, there's only one infinite being. One life, and that life is my life now. But I wonder if we ever grasp the enormity of understanding that. There's one life, that's all there is. There's nothing else going on, there's nothing else happening. One life, and that life is my life now. It's on a banner out there, all there is is God. God is all there is. That's another name for life. And so, for me, the best way to describe source, infinite being, the creator of it all, is life with capitals. Because all things come from life, as life, to live and be life. And so we have this uh, difficulty in being able to describe the higher power, our source, whatever that is, because there is no describing it. It cannot be described. It's impossible to describe it. You see, words are symbols, and symbols point to something greater, to a greater reality. So the word is not the thing itself. It is a symbol that points to something greater. And so when we look at this thing called life that we are all in, and that we are all the one thing in it, it's like if you take a drop of water and you put it into a bucket of water, it touches every part of the water and affects every part of the water. Well, we're kind of like that. You take one aspect of God, you throw it in the mix, and then it all merges and touches everything, and everything is affected by that one aspect. Notes in a symphony, the whole symphony is affected by each and every note, and it wouldn't be a symphony without each and every note. So the merging of the blending of the music creates that which, you know, raises us up transports us, and so on. If I look at the word butterfly, um, I'm not just thinking of a little fluttery thing that's fluttering in the sky, a little creepy crawly thing that's crawling along the ground. The word butterfly indicates to me something much more than that. It takes me into an energy of evolution and emergence and transformation and soaring. It's so much more than the word. But if I did never hear of a butterfly or know of a butterfly, I wouldn't get that. I wouldn't know what that was. It would be two-dimensional flat word butterfly. What's that? And it's the same thing with this thing called the one life, which is what most people call God. Now, God has been a great inhibitor to many until now because of the way God has been introduced into lives. Um, from the point of view of misunderstanding what God is. And uh, I'll say it up front and now, nobody will ever fully understand it or describe it, nor can anyone do that. It's not supposed to happen that way. We're always going to be unfolding deeper and deeper and deeper meaning of what this thing called God, what this thing called life is. And so... In our, um, in our Middle East, we have, um, you know, the, the Arabic people have, be they have 99 beautiful names for God. 99 beautiful names for God, at least. And I mean, there are as many names for God as there are people because we all have our own perspective and our own idea and understanding of what this thing called God is. 
But basically, it's a power. Basically, it's a presence. Basically, it's an energy. It's an infinite intelligence, infinite universal intelligence. This thing called life is something that is forever and ever and ever. Life is always God. God is always life. And it cannot pass on, and it cannot come to an end. It's an ongoing, expanding thing. It's energy. Energy is indestructible. So one thing morphs into another, into another, into another in the phase of evolution. And as far as we are concerned, when we're morphing into the next thing and the next thing, we're just becoming more refined and a higher vibrational level at a higher conscious awareness. That's what goes on as we morph into this, that, and the next body of things. But it's so important to grasp the concept that God is not God. The God that we were taught about is not God. I mean, once upon a time, a long time ago, fado, 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 that means long, long ago, in a land far away 200 years ago, I grew up and I was taught that, you know, God was this kingly, enthroned person in heaven, in a kingdom with pearly gates, and at the gates stood St. Peter, and he had that book of judgment, and he was checking that naughty or nice list to see whether or not you could get in. <laughs> I think that's where they got it for Santa, naughty and nice. <laughs> and of course, as I grew up, I realized this is a whole load of um, um, <laughs> raw mesh. Raw mesh is the Irish word for rubbish. And um, so uh, my uh, concept of God developed and developed and developed and developed and developed and is still developing. And it's nothing like the one I had when I was a child. So mine is open at the top now, my concept for God. But I do understand it in a much more um, uh, intimate way than ever before because I do really get that it is a presence, and I do really get that it is a power, and I do really get that it is an energy, and I do really get that you can actually feel it, and I do really get that you can have a relationship with it, very intimate, close, personal relationship with this thing called life. You can feel it in your bones even at times. I do get that. And so I understand it in a whole different way. And I also get that I can get it out there as well as in here, but I will not get it out there until I first get it in here. That I really do get. And then once I get it in here, it's everywhere present. Oh, it really does become omnipresent. It's here, it's there, it's over there, it's him, her, and so on and so forth. It doesn't matter what's going on. In the appearance, nevertheless, that's where the light is. That's where life is. And so it's important for you and for me to get a bigger concept about ourselves. As I was saying this morning, this week is calling us to a greater vision, to call forth a greater vision of ourselves, and to stop thinking about ourselves as these small, narrow, confined human beings with all of our petty nonsense that goes on and the stories we tell ourselves and the labels we slap on ourselves and the way we limit ourselves. It's so much bigger than that. You are so much more than that. You are so much greater than that. You are magnificence itself. You are genius. There's absolutely nothing and no thing that you couldn't get up to for good if you wanted to, if you understood and realized the truth of your being and what indwelled you. That power, that force, that intelligence that is burning and yearning inside of you for self-expression through you, through you. And all we have to do is get out of our way by balancing out our egos and not allowing our egos to control our lives. That's all we have to do, <laughs> all. It's a big job. Because ego has been ruling the roost for so long. But nevertheless, it's doable. It's doable. We are called to transformation and change. We can have metanoias, which is a beautiful word for a change of heart. I love that, metanoia. And so you and I can change anything in our lives if we just can change our minds and keep our minds changed. Changing your mind is not a problem. We do it all the time. It's changing it back to where it was that's the problem. It's keeping it changed is the challenge. 
And so if we change our minds about ourselves, if we get a new or greater vision of ourselves, if we understand ourselves as, a, as much more than what our lives suggests we are, no matter how good that is, then we're getting it, we're getting it, we're ready, we're ready for the new and the more and the increase. We're ready to get into that transformation and soar. And it's given to everybody without exception. There are no exceptions. Everybody is called to greatness. Everybody's called to magnificence. Everybody's called to genius without any exception. But it's not going to happen without the vision, without the vision, without the vision. We need to call a great vision into our lives. We need to sow the seeds of greatness if we are to reap the rewards. We need to sow the seeds of greatness, and so that means looking at yourself in a whole different way. Looking at yourself, not just as your little small self, but as the divine aspect of being that you are and trusting that powerful creative process within you that knows how to transform your entire life through you identifying with your divinity as well as with your humanity. The challenge is we're mostly identified with our humanity and mostly ignore our divinity, and that's why we get ourselves into all kinds of scraps and up to all kinds of trouble. But the good news is, it doesn't matter how debauched your life has been right up until this minute, you could be the worst person on the planet. You could turn that around like that. Because that power and that presence, that light, that wisdom within you, that intelligence, has never been impaired. It is in its pristine state as it always was. And there's nothing you can do to deplete it or destroy it. Nothing. You can be your bad self as much as you want to be your bad self, but you cannot diminish it in any way, not in the slightest. Not in the slightest. And sooner or later, you'll get a grip. Sooner or later, you'll wake up. Sooner or later, you'll discover the divinity within yourself, and you'll go from sinner to saint. That's the way it is. Remember, every saint has a past, and every sinner has a future. That's the way it always has been, and that's the way it always will be. And so it's up to you, it's up to me, if we choose this day a blessing or a curse. What would a curse be? Mindless living. Mindless living, random living, very dangerous, very dangerous way to live, randomly, very dangerous. What would be a blessing to choose to be mindful in my day, and take control of my day, be in charge of my day, and be intentional in my day? Now, you may say, well, you know, this thing called life, this thing called God, this thing called whatever it is that you yourself may not have named for yourself yet, I say pick your own name that suits you and your sense and sensibilities. I picked mine for God. I call God Yummy. That's my favorite name for God, for life. <laughs> yummy. It's very yummy. It's very yummy. So that's one of my favorite names. I have other names, too. And... Uh, it's, it's always to do and associated with a feeling, with a feeling at any given time, because it is a feeling. You can feel God. You can feel the presence of life. You can feel that wonderful, intimate presence with you. Now, Jesus in St. John's Gospel tells us that God is spirit, spirit. Now, just, there's no description of what that looks like. And anywhere in the scriptures, you won't find any description of what God looks like. Indeed, they point out, do not make graven images. You cannot image God. Three-dimensionally, it's impossible. So don't even try. But the challenge for us is this thing called God, we've conjured up this you know, anthropomorphized person as God because in ancient past, you know, ancient Greek, ancient Rome, ancient Egypt, ancient Mesopotamia and all of that, they all had their gods and their goddesses. And of course, they had human characteristics as well as godly ones. So these gods and goddesses kind of get into our um, psychic and our way of thinking about that which is godly. And of course, that's not who or what God is. And you might say to me, okay, Jesus also said that God is Father. Call God Father. Ah, oh, yeah, but you have to understand context, culture, and language. In that time, 
father. The term father was used in the Aramaic Hebrew culture as an endearing term. As an endearing term. So you would get sisters and brothers and mothers and fathers all calling each other father. It was just like saying darling or sweetheart. It was an endearing term. Jesus never meant to give a masculine personality to God by calling God Father. It was just a very intimate, endearing term that he used for this thing called life or God or the deity or the source or the creator or first cause, whatever, whatever we're going to try and call God. But you and I now know that somehow or another, there is no such thing as alone. There is no such thing as separate. There is no such thing as a private individual thought. It all affects everything else because there's one life and we're all living it. There's one mind and we're all in it. So what I'm thinking is going into the collective and it's either creating a wonderful vibe or a toxic one. And so I'm either taking life up or I'm bringing life down, depending upon what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, what's going on. But if we aim at least 51% of the time, that's a majority to be on the right side of life, the light side of life, the bright side of life, the affirmative side of life. That is a wonderful thing. That gives you 49% to play around with. I mean, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. Just all of us, 51% of the time, we could reach that quantum number when suddenly into every human consciousness there is that ability to soar, transform, and be the best of ourselves like Watson's 100 monkey. And so that's what we're aiming toward. So you come into this room, and I come into this room, and we have our troubles and our trials and our tribulations and our angst and so on and so forth. And it's all a nonsense. Because we don't have to keep all of that. We don't have to entertain all of that. We can take our minds off of all of that and put our minds on something that is more noble, as Paul says. If there's anything good and holy and true and noble and of good report, think upon these things, not on the awful stuff, the sensational stuff, the negative stuff. Think on what it is you want to uh, grow in your life, produce in your life, because that's what you will do. Because as you think it, so it is. If it's in my imagination, it's going to be outpictured into my experience. If I expect it, I'm going to experience it. So I better be on the expectancy of good, you see. On the expectancy of good. I don't want to be like Job. Oh, that which I fear the most has come upon me. <laughs> well, of course, you brought it into your experience through your fear and through your negative thinking. So. For life to change, I have to change. What in me has to change? My thinking has to change. My thinking has to change. When my thinking changes, my mood changes. When my mood changes, my behavior changes. When my behavior changes, my life changes. That's the chain of, of, uh, of activity and circulation. It goes like that. So we are called this week to get a greater vision about ourselves and our lives and living. Ours and the world and others too. A bigger perspective, a deeper image, a wider vision of what truth is and coming from the truth that sets us free. That God is all there is, there is only God and that's that. Life is all there is and we're all in it and it's one life and that's that. So when we grasp that, we understand that it's easy to see the connectedness of it all. If there's one life, we're all in it, and we're all living it. And more than that, we are it itself. We're the it that's in life living itself. Go and try and figure that one out. <laughs> and then you see, all right, whom, whom is, you know, who do I choose to be today? Am I going to be my little self with all my trials and tribulations and so on? Or am I going to endeavor to be the truth that I am indeed, an ever-expanding, unfold, unfolding, emerging power, force, and energy for good. You see, my dear ones, this wounded world awaits your good, your peace, 
your understanding and your love if it's going to heal. We have to be the good in the world that we desire for the world. And for that to happen, we're not going to be able to do that by ourselves. We have to be connected with our source. We have to know that of myself I do nothing. It is the power, it is the presence of the almighty source of my being that does the work. And so when we do that, and we all have a sense that there's something more to life than just ourselves. You know, there is this thing called, and I only discovered it recently, there is this thing called um, the, um, the National Community Service Cooperation. Uh, corporation and it doesn't take them but they do they come up over and over again and they say that volunteerism is the best medicine you could take volunteerism is the best medicine you could take because when you volunteer what are you doing you're engaging in selfless service what is selfless service selfless service is endeavoring to meet a need where you find it without any sense of reward for yourself or without any result in mind. The need is there, you see it, and you endeavor to meet it. That's selfless, selfless service. It was Satya Sai Baba that put it very simply when he said, he said, the body needs to be utilized in service because the greatest bliss comes from serving others and not merely serving ourselves. And he put it very beautifully and very simply. Why is service so important? And you'll hear it all the time. It's because you are life in capitals. I am life in capitals. The nature of life is love. Life is love. That's what Jesus was saying when he called God Father. He was just saying God is love. God is love. That's what he was saying when he called God Father. God is love. Love is God. Love is life. So life is love and the givingness of itself back onto itself. That's what you and I are called to be, life giving itself back onto itself. Life is always giving itself away, spreading itself around. It always experiences an increase when it does that. And when we enter into that selfless service, when we enter into that volunteerism, whatever that looks like for each one of us, we find, and this is statistically written up, we find that we lower our blood pressure, our circulation improves, stress dissipates itself significantly, our moods are balanced, and all other good things happen too. In fact, what we discover is that as we are helping to support others, care for others, helping others to heal, we heal ourselves. We heal ourselves. Isn't that a beautiful thing? And it's just a byproduct of what happens when you give yourself away in loving service, in kindness and in compassion, in understanding and the realization that our only reason for being is to be love in action. God in action, life in action, on the upside of life. And each and every one of us can do that. We don't have to go to school to learn how to do that. We can raise people up through a word, a pat, a smile, you know, a kind demeanor. My mother always used to say, you may not always be able to oblige, but you can always speak obligingly. And it's so true. It's so very true, you know. And it takes just little things, little things to a child. You say something positive and powerful to a child. You raise them up and it gives them hope. Teachers, I know because I taught for 25 years, it can make all the difference in a child's life. You t to show them the vision of themselves that they can be and a future that is great and glorious and grand. We're here to pick each other up, raise each other up, call each other to a high vision of ourselves so that we can be doing what we're here to do, healing the world, and in so doing, healing ourselves of the nonsense that we have allowed ourselves to believe and think about ourselves because that's the cause of all our ailments, what we think what we think. So this week, I am knowing that each and every one of us is going to call forth a greater vision for ourselves and for our world, and in so doing, expand that awareness of what it is to be alive, to be alive, 
to touch the energy of everything that is alive. When you look at the flowers at this time, when you look at the trees at this time, when you look at the burgeoning creation at this time, it's all bursting to express itself in lifefulness. Well, why leave yourself out of all of that? That would be sad to leave yourself out of all of that that's going on around you. The beauty and the power and the presence of nature is calling us forth, calling us higher, calling us into a deeper, wider vision. There is nothing, no thing that you cannot come through. There is nothing, no thing that you cannot overcome. There is nothing and no good thing that you cannot attract. There is nothing in your way except you. Get out of your way. Are you on? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. And when are you starting that? Now. So it is.